Um, as you were talking about, I think that the, the point that struck home for me the most is this concept of how do we add on a benefit without adding on too much risk. And I was wondering, you know, when we think of uh, Dr. Goldhaber and I see patients who need to be on long-term anticoagulation for venous thrombosis, and then they end up having an ACS, um, you're add adding anticoagulation and dual antiplatelet agents. When you, when you think about the use of rivaroxaban for patients who don't need full anticoagulation, but just the ACS benefit, do you think that that might be something where we would be able to focus on patients who are high risk for recurrent uh, cardiovascular events, but low risk for bleeding rather than applying it on a population basis? Yeah. I, I think there are two main items that come out of that question. One is, as you say, balancing everyone's thrombotic risk with their bleeding risk. And it may be different in different patients. We know a lot of the risk factors travel together. But we probably need to be doing a better job of trying to figure out where does, where does someone fall into these different quadrants. I think the second theme that has really come up is that if you have patients who need to be on oral anticoagulants, the patients you're describing, and in many cases they need to be on full-dose anticoagulation for a period of time, in that case we really have been trying to do a better job in the cardiology community of coming back or pulling back on some of the antiplatelet therapies and potentially even giving patients bare metal stents, for example, versus drug-eluting stents, so trying to limit the duration when patients are on full triple therapy. Excellent. We have uh, time for uh, one question or two quick questions from the audience. John Finicos. Uh, <laughs> wonderful presentation, Dr. Mega, and thank you for coming. Can you briefly, um, I believe River Roxaban went to the FDA for review, and could you comment briefly on what their position was in acute coronary syndromes? So it did undergo review. Uh, as you know uh, all too well, there's usually a number of different cycles and looking at different data. There were two things that they were grappling with, and this is something that has been publicly discussed. One is how do we reconcile the data from ATLAS and then appraise? And I think some of the explanations that we talked about today were the same things that people at the FDA are grappling with. Uh, the second thing is looking at some of the data. There was a certain number of patients, even though when we do these trials, we do them, the duration of this trial was 31 months. And there were some patients that didn't have follow-up right until the very end. If we re-evaluated all of the data, there was actually over 96% of the data was complete. And so just getting a handle on making sure that no stone was left unturned. And so the FDA is currently evaluating all that as well. All right. Well, Jess, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you.